Salam alaikum. Friends, brothers and sisters. Um, may I begin by giving you greetings from Scotland and by thanking uh, those who brought me here and in particular uh, Ahmed who had to wait at Gatwick Airport for myself and Nizam Mohammed. Um, thanks to EasyJet, we were three hours late. And um, when we arrived here at the hotel at 3 a.m. in the morning, I thought that the hotel receptionist also probably worked for EasyJet. It took him half an hour to check us in, however. Um, I am here, and I'm very grateful um, to those who have funded the conference. I know the hard work that has gone on to make this happen. And I cannot convey enough my support and wholehearted respect for what you have done to bring the international community here together in London to focus on what has been the silent and forgotten war on Yemen. Sad, but I'm nonetheless delighted that we have the opportunity to focus on this international disaster. And the previous film, I recognize the song uh, only too well, The Sounds of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel, a wonderful song, and indeed I agree that to date, to date, it has been the silent war. But today, I know that we will change that. Because amongst us and the journalists and those who tweet and put out on social media uh, the statements, and we will be repeating each other, but that does not matter. Because the message must come out loud and clear that it can be the silent war no more. And indeed, I agree with um, the opening speaker, Lindsay German, who said that the lack of media coverage has been a disgrace, with some notable exceptions from The Guardian and Channel 4. This Saudi-led coalition, of course, includes the countries of Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and Sudan have waged this war on the Yemen. And it was as far back as January when The Guardian reported that the United Nations panel has ruled that this Saudi-led bombing campaign against Yemen contravenes international law and that there has been widespread systematic attack on the population. And importantly and sadly, the response has been far too slow to act. I wanted to say just a word about Scotland and how the Scots react to international concerns. And you may know, if you know anything about my background, that I'm an activist on Palestine, um, that I chair the Middle East North Africa Forum in Scotland, and I believe wholeheartedly in a change to the UK's foreign policy in this region. But the Scottish nation have always shown its solidarity for those in need. And only um, last week, I'm proud to say um, that in the uh, <clears throat> well-covered match with my, my own team, Glasgow Celtic, which played the Israeli side on Wednesday night, were warned by the police that any supporter, any Celtic supporter, who was to wave a Palestinian flag at the match would be arrested on site for contravening our, our breach of the peace law. And of course, you know that Celtic faces now a fine uh, for breaching the UEFA rules. And I am proud to say, not just as a Celtic supporter, but as a proud Scot, that there were over 1,000 Palestinian flags <laughs> waving at Celtic Park in defiance, in defiance and in solidarity for the Palestinian people. And I have no doubt that Scottish people will also, when they learn of our involvement 
in support of the Saudi-led coalition against the poor people of Yemen will do more. I'm proud to say that our leader, Jeremy Corbyn, and the then Shadow Secretary, Foreign Secretary, Hilary Benn, did send a joint letter to the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, asking for full details of British involvement in this coalition. You might have heard the United Nations uh, envoy to Syria talk recently about airstrikes on refugee camps and on weddings, on schools and mosques and on airports. And of course, it could easily not be Syria. It is also Yemen or Gaza or Lebanon. And there is a recurring theme. But I think it is important to draw out the facts here that, as many speakers have said, 80% of the Yemeni population now in dire need of food and water. How bad does it have to be before the world wakes up to this? And recently it was revealed by the Saudis themselves that the UK and the United States staff were virtually in the command and control centre where bombing is being directed. It's hard to believe that we are justifying our involvement in this war. By saying that it's only advice and training, it's only best practice targeting techniques to ensure compliance with international law. And yet we know ourselves, and from every speaker who has been here on this platform, that in every sense, international law has been violated, humanitarian law has been violated, and yet there has been little consequences. This is why the media coverage is essential, because I know that in the hearts of the British people and the European people and anywhere in the world, we will not stand by and allow this violation of human rights to continue. To expose the myths further, I think it might be worthwhile if you haven't already had a chance to look at the session of the House of Commons, I think Tasmina Sheikh talked about earlier, where the arms export controls um, was examined and Britain's licensing of billions of pounds to Saudi Arabia was defended by ministers and by officials. And so it's clear to me that the values that we have of human decency, of international law, are clearly being compromised by our involvement in supplying weapons to Saudi Arabia and the coalition, which are being used and we know clearly there is evidence for this in this war against innocent civilians. And only this week, the international humanitarian organizations have had to admit defeat in pulling out when six hospitals were bombed. I want to say in my final and closing remarks in my statement, so what do we do now, what do we do next after this conference? I think it's right that other speakers have talked about the poor little Syrian boy, Omran, and not so long ago, the poor little Syrian three-year-old, Alan Kurdi, who was washed up on the shores um, trying to escape from the Syrian conflict. Children all over the world are suffering. In Yemen, in Gaza, and in Syria, and it has to stop. And it can only be by challenging our politicians in every nation. What are our politicians doing to stop the suffering? What are our politicians doing to ensure there is transparency in the dealings of our countries in relation to the export of arms? And I am pretty certain once the world begins to learn of what is happening in the names in our countries across the world. There will be more demonstrations across Europe. There will be more demands for all of the European nations, and not just Britain, to stop arming, stop arming Saudi and Israel and all the other countries which are d damaging 
and causing uh, violations of human rights. We know that the cluster bombs that have been found in Yemen are weapons which have been banned. Now, what is the point of having laws if countries which should know better just continue? And of course, they will say, well, these weapons were not sold recently. They were sold in the 1980s or the 1990s before they were banned. But I'm sorry, that is not good enough for me. You will know that the Scottish Parliament does not have responsibility for foreign affairs. We are a devolved parliament, and that, of course, is a matter for the, for the UK government. But as a UK citizen, I cannot stand by and watch the values of my country be compromised for trade in arms. I do not believe any longer there is any real merit in this relationship. I do not buy into the myth any longer that it is done because somehow Saudi Arabia supplies the United Kingdom with intelligence that is really useful. When we know that Saudi's involvement in other conflicts across the world, not to mention the subject of the brutal ISIS, was talked about by the United Speaker so eloquently. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye to the casualties of war. So we do need a new order in foreign policy. We do need new rules of engagement around the world, and we need to campaign against Britain's involvement in this war or any other European or world nation who has some. We have many obligations across the world to the people of Yemen and to the people of Palestine, the people of Lebanon, who have suffered because we have contravened and compromised on our values. All I can say at this conference um, today is that, as a politician in Scotland, as an individual person, as a human being, I will, with all my might and all my humanity, make sure that there's not a person who speaks to me or who reads my tweets or who looks at my Facebook is not aware, they cannot ever say that they did not know that there was suffering caused by the involvement of our government in the decisions that it takes. And I know that when they see that and when they read that, they will want to join this campaign to ensure that there is a free and independent, self-determined Yemen which has a future. I wish you all the best for your conference. Thank you.